My name is David Hermanson, and I'm from Beamogen Biotechnologies. Um, we're a relatively young company, and today I want to talk about our non-viral gene delivery using DNA transposons. And so what you won't see that you've seen from a lot of other people is you won't see like a pipeline slide or anything like that from me. Really what I want to focus on is just how we are, are trying to provide an alternative to something like lentivirus and um, use our transposon transpose system similar to Sleeping Beauty or piggyback um, for, for clinical use. And so that's what I'm going to focus on, but just very briefly, I'll give you a little bit of the company overview. Um, we have sort of three pillars to the company. The first that I'm going to focus on today is this non-viral gene delivery. Um, this is going to be a transposon transposase platform, and hopefully, um, as you'll see throughout the talk, that the cost of manufacturing is going to be much lower, the consistency in manufacturing should be better. And then really where we differ from some of the other ones like Sleeping Beauty or Piggyback is that we're not going to exclusively lock it up to any single player. Really what we're looking to do is co-develop this offer it as a technology to be used um, in, in sort of co-development type strategies. The second sort of arm of the company is our custom gene editing services. This is what sort of keeps the lights on and the doors open for us. Um, it is growing very rapidly. We, we pride ourselves on being able to take um, very difficult gene editing projects from various customers and deliver those on time um, and with a lot of communication back and forth. So those are some of the things we pride ourselves on in the custom gene editing services wing. And then finally, there's the mitochondrial genome editing that we've been working on. Um, this is another R&D venture. And so this is, we have an exclusive license on this as well, and um, kind of another topic for another day. So to get back to the transposon transpose system and this non-viral gene editing, specifically for clinical use and, and how we sort of see this going. So there's multiple transpose systems out there. Um, as you saw earlier, if you went in the Immunosoft talk, there's Sleeping Beauty, which has also been licensed to Xiofarm. Um, in Trexon and Merck, and that was discovered at the University of Minnesota. It was really kind of the first transposase family identified um, and studied, and so this has also been used in the clinic. Piggyback has been, was discovered and developed by Transposigen, which then spun out Poseida Therapeutics, which is actually where I came from um, before joining Bemogen, and really they're using Piggyback, they have developed a uh, BCMA CAR T cell therapy that is now in phase one clinical trials as well. And then the last family that I have up here is the HAT family of transposases. That's where we're working. Um, and it comes from this red flower beetle. And the main transposase, it's a whole family, there's lots of them in it, but the main transposase that we're focused on is the TC Buster, and that's really where we've done most of our development work thus far. So just very quickly on transposons and transposases and how the system works, if you envision the yellow box as sort of the outer cell membrane, the gray is the nuclear, and then obviously you have your double-stranded DNA. And so fundamentally what you have is the transposon. It needs to be delivered by, as a plasmid. Um, so this is going to be a DNA cargo. It's got these IRDRs on it um, that, that basically sandwich the cargo, and that is what's recognized by the transposase enzyme and allows it to be cut into the genome. So, and then the transposase, that can be delivered via DNA, so it can be delivered as a plasmid, it could be delivered as RNA or as directly as protein as well. Um, for reasons that I'll get into in just a minute, we don't really use DNA very often, um, and those are mostly safety considerations, but basic, the, the, the basic idea is that you need to get both of those into the cell, and once they're into the cell, then the transposase binds those IRDRs cuts out the cargo and is able to insert it and give you stable gene expression in the end. So that's just um, very basically how the transposase system is going to work. So how does this compare to viral methods out there? Um, and so obviously both of them are going to mediate stable gene transfer, and, and that's critical to a lot of gene editing um, therapies. They've both been used clinically. So both the Sleeping Beauty as well as the piggyback have been used 
um, in the clinic and, and produced clinical products, mostly in the CAR-T field. Um, cargo size is one of the big differences. And so really with like a lentiviral vector, you're limited by the 9 KB whole genome size, which really allows you to get maybe six, six and a half KB worth of genetic material into your cell. When you move to transposons, you can get much larger cargo in. And really, people have shown up to like 250 kilobases using transposases. Um, it's probably not realistic in T cells, but certainly you can get 12 KB worth of genetic cargo um, into a T cell, which really allows you to open up and do multi cystronic genes and, and really get fancy with some of the cars. Um, in terms of their ins insertional mutagenesis properties, um, I think every, anyone who's followed the CAR-T field has probably followed the one instance where using lentiviral you had an uh, insertion at the TET2 promoter and then they eventually were able to track that that single cell cleared the tumor, which was great, but it also had some um, growth advantage to it by that insertional mutagenesis. Whereas the transposons, that's never really been observed. And then really when you get into the manufacturing, that's really where the non-viral platform comes into play. Everyone who works with lentiviruses knows that they can be um, very variable in, their, in, in, the, in the product lots. Plasmids, RNA, things like that, they're very, very consistent. It's less lead time to manufacture and just fundamentally easier to work with, easier to store long term so that you can use one batch through a whole clinical study. Um, admittedly, you do face some DNA toxicity when you use the transposon, transpose system, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. And then the viral vectors do have a slightly higher efficiency, although that's being overcome with these hyperactive transposases um, that are able to be developed. So digging in a little bit more into the, the potential or perceived disadvantages of using um, DNA in, in mostly T cells um, is the low efficiency. And like I said, that's been, for the most part, overcome by the, the identification of these hyperactive transposase mutants. You can also get around some of it using um, new plasmid techniques like the mini circle. That brings the IRDRs a little bit closer together, allows for a little bit easier cutting with the transposase and potentially then insertion into the genome. Another often cited concern is this uncontrolled transposition idea, and this is specifically why we don't insert the transposase as a DNA. We don't want there to be any chance that that, that randomly gets integrated into the genome. We want to keep that as an RNA or as a protein so that it goes away quickly and you don't get transposon hopping as you go, um, you know, as the therapy multiplies in the body and, and, and things like that. And finally, the DNA toxicity method. Um, and this is really where Bemogen has some proprietary techniques that we use to get around this problem. And so I'll just show you here. Basically, if you look on the left graph, um, once you put DNA into T cells using standard electroporation methods, your viability can drop to about 50%, whereas with some of our proprietary handling techniques, we can keep it up in the neighborhood of 90%, and that leads to eventual improved cell expansion in the end. So to delve a little bit more into this HAT family of transposases, we do hold um, comprehensive patents for the therapeutic use of the transposon. And then in HEC293 T cells, this is where we've done a lot of our pilot work. Um, we're just sort of moving into T cells now. But in HEC293 T cells, early studies showed that the, HAT, uh, that the TC buster was, had equal um, transposition efficiency as the SB11, which is what's used for Sleeping Beauty um, in clinical trials. We've done some development of transposase variants and hyperactive mutants, and we have, in fact, been able to increase our transposition rates um, somewhat to above SB11 or, or SB100X, which is a hyperactive mutant of Sleeping Beauty. Um, we haven't had a chance to compare it directly to piggyback, but well, you can see that our efficiencies are getting pretty good in, in HEC293 T cells. Um, and I'll show you some T cell data here in just a moment. So we obviously don't want to do this in HEC293 T cells. We want to do this in T cells. That's the biggest market as we see it right now. Although I will say um, we're using this technology with other cell types, such as MSCs. We've, we've done some work with uh, CD34s. 
um, as well as IPSCs. So we're working in other cell types, but obviously the main driver of this is the CAR T cell field. And so just like you would use lentivirus, the, the manufacturing process would be very similar, except rather than um, transducing the cells, you would transpose them using the non-viral technology. And so there's kind of two different methods. Um, and we can do this in either resting or in activated cells. So on the top, I just show sort of the schematic. We would purify the cells. You would activate them. You would then electroporate them with TC Buster. This has generated about 25% effic or efficiency in terms of um, integration with genetic or with generic cargo. And then the, the cells subsequently expand. On the bottom is shown, really all we did here was flip the electroporation with the activation. So if you do it in, in resting cells, one of the things that that allows to do is because we're delivering the transposase via an mRNA, it allows it to stick around a little bit longer and you get better integration. And so here we can get 45 to 50% um, stable integration with generic cargo. And then we're also developing other methods to potentially allow us with that larger increased cargo capacity, what can we put in there that would allow us to get these um, to actually be a pure product? And so this is, this is the transposition rates. Um, on the top there is shown the activated. Um, this is, like I said, a generic cargo with a GFP tag in it. And so you have about 22% or, or across three donors, 20% stable integration. And with resting, we're at 45% across the three different donors. Um, with full expansions, uh, quite good in the 250 to 300 fold range um, in a 14 day growth. So one of the big things that the CAR T field is starting to focus on is the memory phenotype of the T cells. And so I just want to highlight it here very briefly. Um, most of the CAR T cells that are done with lentivirus they come out primarily central memory or even effector memory cells. And really what we're looking for here is these stem cell memory cells. And that's, if you look on the left, it's defined by CD45RA positive as well as 62L positive and CCR7 positive. And these are the cells that really are going to um, lead to a lot, of, a lot of divisions and long um, efficacy in the body and in the patient. And so if you look at the flow plots, what you're really looking at here is the upper right corner. That's where we want to see the cells. That's 45 RA positive as well as 62 L positive. And then on the right side is the CCR7. And so you can see here that all of the markers agree with one another and that we have about 90% of the cells in the stem cell memory phenotype. And that's going to be important. And that has been shown to be important for T cell efficacy um, in the CAR T field. So just to, to summarize quickly, we've achieved greater than 45% genetic efficiency in primary human T cells without any enrichment methods. Um, we are working at more improved transposases. Those are in the pipeline, and we continue to develop those. Um, we do have our proprietary T cell handling methodology, which keeps our post-electroporation viabilities up in the 75 to 90 percent, as opposed to the 50 percent, which is typically seen um, without the special handling. And then in terms of safety analysis, I didn't have time to go into this, but it is a low copy number, which is important for um, the FDA. And then the insertional site preference is safer than that of viral vectors. And finally, as I just highlighted, the T cell composition, comp composition is greater than 80% um, stem cell memory for the CD8s. Oop, I guess I have a typo there. They should, the 80% for CD8s. And so with that, I'll just uh, kind of highlight some of our key personnel. Jeff Leiter is our CEO, and he was uh, formerly from PCT, and so he has a good background um, for GMP manufacture. Brandon and Bo, well, Brandon is one of the founders of the company, um, and the CSO, and Bo is another um, PhD, and they're both at the University of Minnesota um, as professors, and then they sort of are with Bimogen for um, part-time helping us develop these technologies. And so I guess with that, I am just about perfect on time. So thank you for your attention, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk.